Welcome. A warm welcome to our audiences around the world. It's a privilege to moderate this executive briefing focused on the impact of cyber threats on the global entrepreneurship ecosystem. We are grateful to the WBF Financial Inclusion Center, an institute of the World Business Angel Investment Forum for hosting this event. Please allow me to share our event agenda, which will include a keynote and then followed by a dynamic roundtable discussion. And it will conclude with a briefing report that I'll provide with highlights from the WBF Global Survey, as well as our action plan recommended for startups, scale-ups and SMEs so that they can address the current global cyber landscape. Please allow me to also provide a brief introduction to the global landscape that will highlight why WBF did the survey uh, last year and also why we scheduled this executive briefing today. The global negative economic impact impact of cyber attacks has been estimated at $6 trillion, which is larger than most countries' GDP. And the global average cost per data breach due to cyber attacks has been reported to be $4.35 million for calendar year 2022. And the forecast for 2023 doesn't look good. It's way higher, estimated around $5 million. For the 12th year in a row, the United States holds an undesirable title for the highest cost per data breach where we have an average of 9 million per data breach, as reported by IBM in their latest report. The United Nations and the European Union Commission have proposed new rules to establish joint cybersecurity and information security measures. During the most recent Davos 2023 meeting, global leaders expressed their concerns and called on companies to enhance their collaboration and proactive defense measures against a cyber storm of cyber attacks that's predicted to continue. The World Economic Forum's 2023 Global Cybersecurity Outlook Report published in collaboration with Accenture indicated that more than 93% of cyber leaders surveyed and 86% of business leaders surveyed feel that uh, much more has to be done. And they believe that geopolitical forces and increased adoption of emerging technologies may lead to increased cyber attacks over the next year. This report also emphasizes that the cyber attacks increased with 38% in 2022 and is predicted to continue uh, in 2023. The World Bank has also expressed support for leaders and policymakers in the ongoing development, establishment, and implementation of national cybersecurity strategies and policies outlined in their latest national cybersecurity strategy guide. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker. And right after the keynote, I'll introduce all our guest speakers for our panel conversation. So our guest keynote speaker is Chuck Brooks. Please uh, forgive me for cutting all of your bios. Otherwise we would have three hours just reading all our amazing <laughs> bios from our guest speakers. So Chuck is uh, not only our advisory board member for WBF USA country office, but also president of Brooks Consulting International. He's a globally recognized thought leader and evangelist for cybersecurity. LinkedIn named him as the top five tech people to follow on LinkedIn. He was named by Thomson Reuters as top 50 global influencer in risk and compliance by IFSEC as the second global cybersecurity influencer. He is also known as the cybersecurity expert for the network at the Washington Post, visiting editor at Homeland Security Today, and a contributor to Forbes on an almost daily basis, I see an article <laughs> by you, Chuck. He has also been featured author in technology and cybersecurity blogs by IBM, AT&T, and numerous others. In government, Chuck has received two senior presidential appointments covering security and technology issues on Capitol Hill. In industry, he has served in senior executive roles for General Dynamics, Xerox, and many other companies. In media, he's featured uh, as Homeland Security contributor for Federal Times, a regular contributor to Forbes and Huffington Post, and published more than 180 articles on cybersecurity. He has numerous professional industry affiliations, most notably MIT Technology Review, IEEE, Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, Department of Defense, and a featured presenter to the FBI, as well as part of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Advisory. I had to abbreviate, Chuck, so please forgive me again, but I'm looking forward, I'm sure as our audience as well, and our guest speakers to your keynote, and then uh, I would love to dive into our panel discussion right after. Welcome.
Great. Uh, thank you, Ingrid, for that very kind introduction. It's a, it's a special pleasure for me to address the World Business Angels Investment Forum Financial Inclusion Center on the impact of cyber threats on the entrepreneurial ecosystem, and also especially with the esteemed colleagues and globally renowned cybersecurity thought leaders we have on our panel here, uh, which we are all friends and know each other very well. Uh, let me begin by saying that the digital environment has become very precarious with each passing year as we transition to digital transformation. The World Economic Forum in their annual study of global risk notes that business, government, and household cybersecurity infrastructure and or measures are outstripped or rendered obsolete by increasingly sophisticated and frequent cyber crimes resulting in economic disruption, financial loss, geopolitical tensions, and also social instability. Both the numbers and the sophistication of these cyber attacks certainly are increasing on threat actors, especially state-sponsored and criminal enterprises are searching for vulnerabilities and infiltrating malware by adapting, adapting and automating, enabling uh, machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, deep fakes, and other discovery and analytical, analytical tools. This sense of cyber vulnerability is also growing reality for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. The ecosystem includes startups and new ventures and primarily small businesses of all industries and verticals. The cybersecurity in itself is an area of investment in entrepreneurship with over $150 billion in annual spending. <clears throat> Often these new ventures operate with limited resources and lack even basic cybersecurity and risk management plans. Unfortunately, criminal hackers know that startups and small businesses are low hanging fruit for phishing and ransomware attacks have increasingly been targeting them. It's not only the financial resources of entrepreneurs and criminal hackers target, but the, the IP, the patents, and the innovation elements that are at the core of new ventures that really fuel our economy. The bottom line that is almost every type of startup and small business touches aspects of cybersecurity, whether it's in law, finance, transportation, retail, communications, entertainment, healthcare, or energy. Uh, I left a lot out, but there are a lot more verticals too, but every vertical is, is impacted. Uh, cybersecurity threats are ubiquitous, and yet little is being done to defend their vulnerabilities. Most startups and small businesses lack cyber preparedness, and this is my underlying theme. Despite a clear need to improve cyber hygiene, most startups and organizations are failing to take basic steps, like even strengthening passwords, patching their software, or even using multi-factor authentication. According to Accenture's cost of cybersecurity study, 43% of attacks are aimed at small businesses, but only 14% are prepared to defend themselves. And many of these businesses that their attack actually just go out of business. And this is the same with startups who if experiencing one or two attacks basically cannot recover. Other cybersecurity statistics are also telling. A recent Verizon report points out that 71% of cybersecurity breaches are financially motivated, whether 25%, whereas 25% takes place with the motivation of espionage, and we're seeing more of that now too, particularly with the, the Ukrainian-Russian uh, conflict and with China's uh, uh, big involvement in, in uh, procuring technologies. 52% of breaches feature hacking, 28% involve malware, whereas 32 to 33% are performed through phishing and social engineering. According to Cybersecurity Ventures, which Ingrid mentioned up front, it is estimated that cybercrime will propel global spending on cybersecurity products and services to 1.75 trillion uh, this coming period and over 6 trillion uh, annually uh, from 21 to 25. Against these backdrop of ominous statistics, hopefully the lack of cybersecurity awareness and preparation will change soon. Uh, better cybersecurity success will necessitate more public private cooperation, especially through such threat sharing and funding, cyber resilience, business continuity, innovation and collaboration between government and industry stakeholders and a proven model that makes good sense. Together, government and the private sector or governments, because we're talking globally, can identify products and align flexible product paths, evaluate technology gaps and help design, evaluate and stimulate scalable architectures that will lead to more efficiency and, and also fiscal accountability. Economic regulations are also a key part of this cybersecurity equation. There's been a push by governments uh, to make business more responsible for their, their cyber preparedness. Uh, privacy regulations and issues such as GDPR and CCPA 
are instilling companies to implement better safeguards for consumer data, especially financial, healthcare, and retail industries, which are the prime uh, victims of attack, or face hefty fines and possibly uh, tarnished reputations. And just a couple of weeks ago, the White House announced a plan to make the private sector step up more and take more actions to make their own products more secure by security by design. What should we do as entrepreneurs and startups? Uh, because startups and small businesses have become the primary target of such criminal hackers, securing data necessitates a hyper security focus for, the, for them and actually for all consumers too. They have a responsibility not to ensure their own sensitive data, but also ensure that their products and services do not put their clients at cybersecurity risk. For startups and small businesses, this means having cyber expertise in the leadership, establishing a vigilant cyber risk management strategy that encompasses identifying gaps, assessing vulnerabilities, and mitigating threats. They also should develop a coordinated incident response plan to respond to potential breaches and mitigate potential damages. More specifically, cybersecurity for entrepreneurship should consider operational capabilities for the integration of emerging technologies, uh, such as artificial intelligence for identity management, authentication, horizon monitoring, malware mitigation, encryption, resilience, and forensics. In our era of exponential digital connectivity, any startup or company's operations, brand reputation and revenue pipelines are really at risk. There was a growing recognition that cybersecurity should be considered more than a business cost item and a necessity to ensure that the business continuity is, is assured. For, all, for the entrepreneurial ecosystem and all players involved and connected to it, being aware of the resources available and operational requirements for cybersecurity is our starting point. At that uh, juncture, I'll, I'll finish my, that's the end of my comments and I look forward to discussion of uh, some of these ideas. Thank you. Thank you for that insightful keynote. We appreciate it. And it was a great uh, global state of the union. So now I'm looking forward to diving into our conversation. Please allow me to also introduce our other guest speakers. First, I would like to introduce Shara Robinu. She's a recognized cybersecurity executive, cybersecurity and blockchain advisor, global keynote speaker and influencer who has built two cybersecurity product companies and led multiple women in technology efforts. She currently serves as president of the New York City-based technology incubator Prime Tech Partners and the social media security firm Secure My Social. She also serves as an advisor on numerous boards and has been honored with several awards such as New Jersey's Best 50 Women in Business, was named by CSO Magazine as Women of Influence and Outstanding Woman in InfoSec and numerous other recognitions. She has also been calculated by analysts to be the top female cybersecurity influencer globally on social media. She provides guidance to numerous Fortune 100 companies, has published extensively, holds several granted patents or patents pending, and her recent book, Cyber Minds, is now available on Amazon. Welcome, Shira. Then our next guest speaker is Helen New. She's the founder and CEO of Tygon Advisory Corporation, as well as vice chair of Global Cybersecurity Association and host of CXO Spice. Let me just make sure we, we have the proper... Uh, Helen, are you? Yes, right there, great. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we capture you on camera for a beautiful pic. As board director, Helen brings a unique perspective to the boardroom, combining deep technology thought leadership, cybersecurity risk management, go-to-market strategy, customer experience to deliver thoughtful questions and insights that help drive informed decisions. She helps CEOs achieve multi-billion dollar revenue growth and record profitability from startups to global titans like Oracle and Adobe. She's a board advisor to fast growth SaaS companies and is global chair of manufacturing supply chain at G100. She's spoken at numerous leading conferences. She's an avid adventurer who treks Mount Everest base camp and ice climb glaciers. So I'm super impressed by that. I had to include that. And her book, Ascend Your Startup, Conquer the Five Disconnects to Accelerate Growth, won first place in business category at the New York Book Festival. Welcome, Helen. Then I would also like to welcome Mr. Matthew Rosenquist. He's a cybersecurity strategist and benefits from 30 diverse years in the fields of cyber, physical, and information security. 
He is currently serving as the CISO for Eclipse.io. Um, he is a member of multiple advisory boards and consults on best practices and emerging risks to academia, businesses, governments across the globe. He specializes in security strategy, measuring value, developing best practices for cost-effective capabilities, and establishing organizations that deliver optimal levels of cybersecurity, privacy, ethics, and safety. He also identifies evolving risks and opportunities to help organizations that want to balance threats, costs, and usability factors to achieve an ideal level of security. He's very active in the industry as an influencer, an experienced keynote speaker, collaborates with industry partner to tackle pressing problems and often also presents at, at conferences. His focus is to enable an organization's ability to achieve success by helping leadership identify a path forward in managing long-term security, privacy, and safety risks. Uh, unfortunately, oh, Dr. Michael, you're here. Dr. Michael Mirip, he's our next guest speaker. Wonderful to have you join us. He's a distinguished fellow for cybersecurity, also serves at the University of Miami Institute of Data Science and Computing. And he's a technologist with 20 years of experience developing innovative cybersecurity and digital solutions. He has successfully launched, led, and advised various tech companies and has held numerous advisory positions with industry, government, and academia. He held senior technical and leadership positions working with the U.S. Department of Energy and Defense, Deloitte, U.S. Cyber Consequences Unit, Lakeside Oil, MIT, uh, Harvard Bergman Center, and was also a senior advisor to Richard Clark. He completed his doctorate focusing on cyber resilience and organizational change at George Washington University and is the recipient of a number of distinguished awards, such as Fulbright Scholarship, Cyber Corps, DOS, Critical Language Scholarship, Rosenthal Fellowship, FTD National Security Fellowship, and several others. Thank you all for joining me. I think our audience agrees that we have like the top cybersecurity uh, leaders attending today. So I'm really excited to hear your opinion about uh, what the state of the union is now, and then we'll dive into a little bit uh, deeper discussions for startups, scale ups, and SMEs. So let me start uh, the round with Shira. Can you please share with our audience what your observations are in the current ecosystem? Thank you, Ingrid, and um, very uh, honored to be here with this distinguished panel. Uh, it's going to be a very lively, interesting conversation from such brilliant minds. So happy to be here today. So as we know, the emerging digital ecosystem is something to be dealt with. In our current digital environment, every company is reachable target, everyone, large or small. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Every company, they have operations, brand, a reputation, revenue pipelines that are potentially at risk from a breach. And when we talk about that, certainly the number one factor that we all talk about are phishing attempts, how they're reached, whether it being email or and with the advancement of ML, we certainly know that, that is, they're able to create much more believable type phishing schemes that are able to trick organizations or people within organizations that might be success, susceptible, pretty much all of them, um, to these phishing attacks. And as we all have seen, ransomware is one of the biggest threats and we have seen exponential growth over the years and it's just getting stronger and stronger. And these ransomware attacks could lead to high returns for these bad actors and uh, crime groups. So it's important to stay on top of what I start, we talk about, which is cyber hygiene. That's I call basic cybersecurity within organization, ongoing training, uh, cyber awareness, updated security and patching, zero trust within the organization. And you need to be proactive as well as reactive. The proactive plan is just as important as re your reactive plan. So as we understand that it's not if, it's a when, so you need to be prepared on both ends in a very strong way. Um, when we think about how you protect against ransomware attacks, you have to think about access. Who has access? Again, talking about if you dive into the zero trust piece, but also access between machines, access who talks to one another, how we are able to segment the different types of um, networks that are talking one to the other. And early detection is key to effective protection. That would be, you know, in terms of being proactive and reactive. Um, I could dive in deeper around that, but I'll give my other panelists uh, time to weigh in or else, you know, we could all cover the same thing and I don't want to be redundant, but I'm interested to hear more from everybody else as well. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. <clears throat> Helen, maybe you can share what you hear in the boardrooms and when you act, interact with C-suite leaders, if they really have changed uh, their approach or is it just in these international reports that we see that there is a shift in the mindset? Please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, delighted to be here with all of you. Uh, today, uh, I would you know address that from five perspective, right? Number one, economic impact. Cybersecurity threats are having a significant economic impact, you know, at a global level. Uh, according to cybersecurity ventures, uh, cyber crime is really projected to cost 10.5 trillion every year by 2025. I think Chuck shared some alarming uh, data earlier. And this is not about just the direct cost of lost productivity and revenue. It's also reputation damage, right? There are a lot of untangible impact there. Number two is about investment in cybersecurity it is absolutely on the rise. Business and governments recognize the importance of protecting their assets and data and the global cybersecurity market is projected to grow from 173 billion in 2020 to 270 billion uh, in 2026. So this is according to market and markets. Uh, and then from cyber risk perspective, uh, the most common types, right? Sarah, Sarah uh, mentioned quite a few of them. We all know that um, today there's a phishing attack malware and ransomware and, and cybersecurity venture talks about every single two seconds, there's gonna be one ransomware. That's really alarming. You think about in a given minute, that's 30 attacks, right? Um, so that's being said, there are many other, other types of risk and we, every single day I receive at least one phishing email. All of you probably see that as well. And then there's a you know DDoS there as well, engineer, social engineer attacks, and then some insider threats as well. And then fourth uh, aspect is the regulations, right? Governments around the world are enacting cybersecurity regulations to help protect you know, their citizens and business from cyber threats. Um, and for example, GDPR or CISA, there are many of them really trying to uh, put in more uh, regulations in place to protect. Uh, the last thing trend here is a skill set gap. Uh, and we talk about one of the biggest challenge facing cybersecurity industry today is a shortage of skilled professionals. According to Cybersecurity Venture, the number of unfilled cyber jobs grew by 350% from 1 million in 2013 to 3.5 million 2021, right? In India alone, that one country alone, we have 1.5 million jobs, uh, unfilled jobs in cybersecurity. Uh, so that I view that as an opportunity uh, for all the people who wanna get into cyber. And so please bear in mind, you don't have to be a coder to, be, to become a cybersecurity professional. A lot of skill set can be trained. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much for making that important point. Uh, I hear that often in all emerging tech. Everybody thinks they need to be an engineer or have a PhD in engineering. There are so many other jobs in that ecosystem. Great. Thank you. Michael, you sit at the intersection of not only uh, academia, business, but also interact a lot with government agencies and your role in IEEE. I was hoping you can uh, shed some light if there are any new developments there in terms of international standards and if we can look forward to, to some changes there. Absolutely. So first and foremost, Ingrid, um, it's a honor and privilege to be in such a distinguished panel. Um, all of your, your LinkedIn posts and uh, thought leadership I follow as part of my continuing learning, my lifelong learning journey. Um, one of the reasons I decided to pursue cybersecurity, it was something that I knew right away that I could spend the rest of my life pursuing and only get a small sliver um, of, of experience and exposure. My day-to-day -day is um, leading cybersecurity efforts for operational technology and ICS for one of the fastest growing tech companies in the US. So about a year and a half ago, we were, I was employee number 50. We're at about 3,000 right now. And so kind of echoing some of Shira's sentiments on that rapid digital transformation. So we've digitized and networked and automated um, our critical systems, including systems 
that were never designed to be connected to the internet or operational technology, industrial control systems, the systems that keep trains on the rails, manufacturing efficient, weapons platforms accurate. So we've unlocked um, incredible value as part of that transformation. The challenges and part of my data, the challenges how do we reduce that attack surface in a way that doesn't prevent it, does not become a blocker or barrier for value creation? And so to your point and to your question, Ingrid, I think some of the exciting opportunities to do that are in innovative tech. So there's a lot more um, application of machine learning to you know, collect, aggregate, make sense of these large prestigious data sets. There's an increasing application of di distributed ledger technology and blockchain technology, especially in the payments place, uh, to improve our visibility and our provenance and our control of data. Um, but at the same time, the same technologies being used to advance to improve that state are also increasingly being exploited by our adversaries, which are complex, which are nonlinear, which are evolving, and just kind of echoing one of um, Helen's um, sentiments is that the biggest, some of the biggest challenges that I experience, think that we experience in our day to day, aren't necessarily ones and zeros. Machine learning, you know, of the three hundred fifty thousand pieces of new malware introduced every day, machine learning does a really good job of recognizing that one or new zero in the in the heuristic. The challenge, I think, very much is people and how do we protect us from ourselves. Uh, and I think uh, everybody on this uh, panel has done a lot in that space in terms of creating that cyber situation awareness, creating preparedness, but there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more to do. It's still a major gap uh, in this space as we improve our policies and processes, as we improve our technology, uh, the people challenge, the human factors, our grand challenges uh, that present a major gap and threat. Uh, that continue to be exploited by our adversary. So I'm interested in, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, turn the mic over now, uh, because again, this is the panel that, you know, sometimes you're on a panel that you like so much that you'd rather be listening and taking notes. This could, this is definitely one of them. So I'm going to turn the mic over to the, the talented panel. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> I really appreciate all of your comments. And then Matt, you do a lot of education on LinkedIn. So I was uh, hoping you can share with us what is the sentiment from business leaders? What type of questions are you getting? Are we completely detached when we just look at these high level reports from what's happening boots on the ground? Uh, thank you, Ingrid. Yes, and it, it's a pleasure to be here with, with all these brilliant colleagues. Um, the industry, especially in the business industry, they're uh, every sector is really at a different stage of maturity and even within those sectors. And the first thing that we see is, is you know, when we look at entrepreneurship, people really want to avoid cybersecurity. They, they see it as this big, ugly beast. You've seen the numbers. We've talked about them here, right? It is relevant. It is important. But it's also really scary just to jump in. So there's a lot of fear and uncertainty that we have to get over. We've got leaders out there in businesses, and they're willing to take on the world and take on competition. And yet they start to shy away a little bit when we talk about cybersecurity, privacy, ethics in the digital world. And it is scary. The numbers are ugly. It does take a certain amount of leadership, and there has to be a certain amount of knowledge to be able to get traction there. And so one of the first things, you know, and, and my colleagues as well, you know, when we go out and address is, you know, don't let that fear cause you not to take that step forward because we need leadership. We need people out there in business to take that first step to figure out what are those fundamentals? How do I stay up with my peers? I don't want to fall behind. <clears throat> I don't want to be an easy target. And it isn't just technical. We have to worry, yes, about the technology that we use or that we promote or that we design, but we also have to worry about the human element. The attackers are human. The people that created the technology are, you, are human. And the employees and workers are also human. We have to worry about that and the process that then ties everything together. So it is a complex problem, but it's not insolvable. We have to manage risk just as we manage other things within our business. And that's really the hump we need to get over. And once we realize, yes, we're not here to make the world impervious to attack, that's impossible. We're here to find that right balance. 
And for every company and every organization and every sector, that may be a little different and that's okay. But we have to have the right mindset to move into it, to know that it's not impossible. It's not gonna break the bank, right? We can make a difference. And in our day and age, it's now table stakes. As Shira was mentioning, there's no company out there that can't be touched either directly or indirectly. Because it's not just you, it's also your supply chain. It's also your uh, partners, as well as your customers that can be impacted. So we're all in this together. And that first step is really about leadership. We have to step forward, understanding the scope, bringing the right tools and expertise to bear, realizing, again, it's not going to break the bank. It's not going to grind your organization to a halt. There is a good balance for each and every organization out there, as well as sector, that we can drive and we have to continue to evolve. The bad guys are getting better every single day. They're getting well-funded, right? Their budgets are going up, their capabilities. If we do nothing, we fall behind. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And that's where we kind of have to move forward together in intelligent ways to keep pace with the evolving threats. Thank you. I think that was an amazing first round. I really appreciate all the comments. For the second round, I would like us to, to dive a little deeper into what startups, scale-ups, and SMEs can do. And maybe also if each of you can highlight how you work with companies to explain the importance of cyber defense and cyber resilience, because I think that's a big misconception that I see in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And maybe also address the false sense of security that companies sometimes have that if they just buy a shiny software once a year, they'll be protected. I think all of you touched on the human capital and the workflows that also need to change. So maybe share a little bit how you work with business leaders and how you translate uh, the, the elements into practice. So um, Chuck, do you want to chime in on that first? Sure, and then we'll I'd go with Sharon. happy to. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, at first, I, I, the, the panelists really gave us a succinct uh, overview of, of a lot of the key elements in cybersecurity. And I think this uh, webinar uh, should be shared uh, widely because of that, because it, it, it really can address a lot of the corporate problems right up front that way. But uh, the real issue, I think, you know, what we're all talking about is cybersecurity awareness, and that comes down to risk management. And, uh, you know, because the Internet was not built for security and uh, there is no security design built in. You know, we're, we're uh, at, a, at a big handicap and it's uh, the problem is that a lot of the attackers have an asymmetrical advantage. So what can we do? We have to do the easiest things first. And, and, and as you mentioned, one of the easiest things to do is cyber hygiene. Yet most companies and most boards don't know what, what to do. They, they, uh, they don't uh, have strong passwords. They don't have firewalls, half of them. Uh, they don't encrypt their sensitive information. They don't keep it separately. So uh, I think part of the, the first thing that, that everyone should do if they're involved with the consulting arrangement with any, any client is say, okay, look at your risk management profile. Have you done a penetration test? Do you know where your vulnerabilities and gaps are? If not, do that first. Second, train your employees, uh, you know, look how to look out for fishes, and then, you know, go into exactly what, what I just said about cyber hygiene. That's all very easy to do, and it doesn't cost much. So there's a lot of programs that will tell you a lot of risk management. Uh, you know, from, from NIST and other places, it'll explain what to do. Uh, you just need to do it. And, and still the problem I see is that uh, despite all these horrible statistics out there and the reality is all these businesses are losing money and going out of business, you know, they, they still don't prioritize um, the, the basics of, of what, you know, of cybersecurity awareness or, or preparation is. And, and so with, with talking to, to, uh, to clients, I say, you know, you've got to start that as, as, your, as your basis for anything. It doesn't matter what business you're in you need to expect that you will be attacked because you will likely be attacked. Um, as as uh, Michael said that, you know, uh, even it's not, it's not just the IT, it's the operational technology too. It's an industrial control system, which 40% of them were attacked last year by malware. So everyone's in this game. And, and we have a new uh, realization that we're in a digital transformation era. We're moving from brick and mortar to, to the, from physical to the digital. And we have to adopt our, our, our practices and, and, and that's basically what it is. And, and, and by you know, sharing, sharing uh, ideas and articles and talking webinars like this on, on social media is probably the best way we can really impact uh, the landscape. And I think uh, you know, I'm, I'm very 
uh, happy to do that. And I, all my colleagues here, I see all the time. So I think, uh, you know, it ha it's having a, a huge impact in exponential terms. And I think we need to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Shara. Maybe you can also share with our audience. We have, as you know, a lot of angel investors and, and entrepreneurs, also strong women uh, team at WBF. So I was hoping you can share what you're doing in your incubator and also uh, encourage more women to, to be in cybersecurity, which is very near and dear to my heart too. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just preface by saying I, I spend 90% of my time consulting to various companies sort of being later stage startups, venture capitalists, and Fortune 100 companies. So that's really my focus. And uh, lots of room for amazing women and just anybody really who has a great education and, and wherewithal and insight and wants to be involved in cybersecurity. So one of the things I wanted to touch upon, just you know, going back to what else some of my colleagues said in terms of the people, people look at humans as the weakest link in the chain in the cybersecurity chain. So when I talk to clients, I say, don't look at them as the weakest link, make them part of the solution. And making them part of the solution is creating the proper cyber culture within the organization. And that goes from consultant to intern all the way up through the boardroom. And training happens all the way throughout and continuously. And we talk about you could have the greatest people in the organization, the greatest technology there. But if you don't have the glue in the middle, so we call the people, the process, and the technology. So great people, really great, you know, educated, wherewithal, the the greatest system you think you have the greatest workforce, the most updated technology, but if it doesn't work hand in hand in the process, which is the glue that solidifies the two together, you're not going to have a well-oiled machine. So it's creating that cyber, car cyber culture within the organization, but also instituting the right measures within the organization in order to make it a well-oiled machine. So one of the things you were mentioning and asking about what SMEs can do, um, I just want to mentioned also what Matt was talking about, the SMEs, they're the gateway to the supply chain that they could be a part of. They could also be a liability to a larger corporation on that supply chain. So if organizations are thinking, you know what, let's just button up the, the mother ship, think about all the different vectors and all the different openings that, that, that carry into these larger corporations. They all feed in, they have access. How do you button it up across the organization appropriately? So beyond the cyber hygiene, think of the value system. Again, the cyber car the cyber culture within organizations, implementing high impact cyber security controls, as Chuck was saying, and, and others is multi-factor authentication, sensitive data encryption. And if an organization can't afford to have their own CISO, which a lot of them can't, so they're not sure how to, how to manage. So there's virtual CISOs that they can bring aboard or consultants such as some of the panelists here and some others that are really highly regarded within the industry that can step in and help create those controls within the organization. And, and creating those cyber hygiene steps like the four we mentioned, the four we talked about. And they could also boost their cyber resilience budgets by migrating critical systems from traditional isolated data centers into the cloud. So besides enhancing financial flexibility and improving agility, they could, it, it could be afforded by this strategy. So figuring out how to do that, migrating to the cloud in order to have the extra levels of security and uh, working as a unit within organizations to work hand in hand and maneuver yourself to a strong cyber uh, cyber posture. Thank you. Wonderful advice for our uh, audience. Mm -hmm. Helen, I was hoping you can also share what you see in the boardroom and then also maybe touch on the ROI because I hear often, and as I'll highlight in our report after the round table, a lot of startups don't feel like they can spare any penny. So maybe to advise them, what type of resource and ROI strategy can they have to, to be uh, in a cyber resilient uh, posture as opposed to, like you all mentioned, under attack and highly vulnerable? Yeah, sure, Ingrid. I mean, the hardest uh, uh, part for startups, as all of you know, is to find the balance of their investment. Um, it's either they, they under invest or they don't want to over invest, right? Because not every company has $10 billion to spend on chat GP, GPT. Um, so that's being said, you know, my company, we provide fractional C-suite C executive uh, to these startups. Uh, so I, you know, I get to see their challenge firsthand. Um, you know, Chuck mentioned about 
preparedness is really critical for these startups that they go through three stages of growth, right? Either from idea to product, product market, market to scale, they run into all sorts of challenges and the board composition for these startups does not work today. That's a fundamental flaw. If you think about it, most of the people on their board, they're from their investors. They need independent board of director with cyber expertise to provide the guidance from the get-go. If I guide, you know, first of all, for these startups, the first thing they need to do is to embed cyber um, minds into their product development, right? You think about it, um, you know, all these startups should, when they build a product, they should think about how do I incorporate SOC 1 or SOC 2 into our product to be, and I call it define minimum variable defensiveness, right? That's what you need to do because you cannot make that after sauce. And getting cyber fit is a lifestyle. It's not, hey, I feel like to go for a fancy meal once in a while. That's not going to work. You have to make it every day, uh, even, you know, fair. So that got to be something top of mind from the very beginning. Unfortunately, many of startups really <laughs> find out, realize that too late, right? By the time they have the product market fit, oh, we forgot about building this embed this uh, feature into the product so that then they have to go back, redo the work. And I, I, you know, my team, we help them to do, go sometimes have to redo what they were supposed to do years ago. That's why, you know, that's the detour they have to take to do it better. That's being said, that's not never too late, right? To build this into your product so you become more defensible. And then you have to always know where you are at. Uh, you have to be honest with yourself, right? Not to say, knowing that you, you need to find expert to help you uncover the areas that you're not really good about. You think about this, we talk about SOC, right? That's your security, availability, process, processing, in integrity. That's your confidentiality and privacy aspect. And how, do, how have you built that into your day-to-day -day operations? And then it's important for these startups to realize that and as you further scale, become a scale up, that's even you're more visible, right? meaning that you probably deal with larger size of clients. And the impact of, you know, the cyber impact is not just about you, it's about your customers, your suppliers, you know, all around you have, you're responsible or you're, you're going to be, you're going to be held accountable for what you do. Uh, not only financial risk, there's also reputation risk. So it's very important to make cybersecurity awareness, right, a Monday. I'm an adventurer, as you mentioned earlier. Every time before I leave for a big trip, you know, I have my checklist. I make sure all the windows and doors are closed, make sure I have a way to remotely monitor my house and make sure I gave a spare key to someone I trust. Make sure I, you know, I actually put the mails away. They're not coming in or lot, you know, I don't have any package coming. If they do, I have someone else to pick it up for me. Make sure if I have a pet, right? How do I take care of them while I'm gone? So there are many things you do that the challenge with startups, they don't have a checklist. A lot of them are clueless about what needs to be done. If they do have something at hand, they would go through one, one by one every single day. That would be an easier thing to do. That's why having these cyber security awareness training it's very important. It should be an ongoing event for them. It's not just a new hire onboarding. It is every single day, not just for your employees, for your partners, investors, for everybody you work with, you need to really invest in that. Those are the basic, right? You also have to have basic cybersecurity control. And we talk about, you know, all of you talk about strong password, multi-factor authentication, regular software updates, right? There's also needs to be firewalls, antivirus software, intrusion detection and prevention system. You know, it'd be better if you automate these. I mean, technology today, investing in that upfront will save you so much trouble in the longer term. And uh, also, there's also, you gotta have a cybersecurity management plan. 
uh, you know, who really is accountable, who manages your cybersecurity, and who would you contact if you encounter a cyber issue? What processes are in place to keep your organization cyber secure? What is your crown jewels that you need to be protected? And you know who owns what data, who has access to what data, you need to constantly monitor them and then pay attention to them. And I work with CEOs or founders at startups, they really don't have those you know, cyber minds at all, right? You have to educate them. You don't blame them because they were not caught, right? They're brilliant in their own way, but they're not caught to think about things in cyber uh, capacity. So you, they have to be educated, you need to hire people, uh, engage with people with that um, mind, cyber mind. But, you know, there's framework. We talk about zero trust. There's this framework they can follow. And they have to partner with third-party service because if they can't afford hiring full-time people, but they can always outsource that to third-party uh, once in a while to make sure there's strategic checkup there, ensure they know where exactly they're at and where the vulnerabilities are so that they can have um, strategy and execution plan uh, in place to really uh, cope with the challenges. And I would say that it is getting cyber fit, making that a lifestyle, and then making that something a mandate for an entire company, starting from the board all the way through every single employee. Thank you. <clears throat> Michael, maybe you can provide a little bit more insight for entrepreneurs to understand how technologies currently can help cybersecurity because I hear a lot of misconception uh, in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Either you are on the side where you love deploying all deep tech such as blockchain and maybe even working on, on already transitioning to Web3 or uh, have your eyes on quantum. And then others are completely wanting to stay away and are, com are confused or, or concerned if they deploy any emerging technologies. Can you help them a little bit understand how to leverage deep tech as a cyber uh, tool and as a cyber portfolio? Uh, absolutely, I think that's I think that's um, a part of an answer is a great question, and there's part of the answer I think is there is that we cannot stop innovating. We cannot stop uh, R and D just doesn't start one day. Um, you have to plant the seeds early on. So I think to start with, you know, SMEs. Um, startups, as capital becomes tight, um, they, they have to effectively allocate resources to buy down risk, right? So if we look at like the NIST five buckets that identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, I, I tend to advise early on, focus on identify and protect, because if you don't know your critical systems and networks, what normal looks like, you'll never detect and be able to respond and recover when you've been um, hacked. Um, that being said, uh, there are some very, very exciting applications now, both in the DLT blockchain space, as well as the machine learning space that can move to kind of what you are saying, Helen, how do we disintermediate and how do we automate um, some things like monitoring, detection? I think we're moving to a lot more application of those systems. We've seen uh, managed security service providers um, that also disintermediate and part automate and add efficiencies to the processes. Um, that are uh, very expensive at the end of the day. I'd also add to this that, you know, in addition to, you know, fostering a culture of cybersecurity, which I absolutely love, and Shira, I'm going to use your quote again, uh, let me know what I owe you, that, you know, people really have to be part of the solution. Uh, because again, as we apply those innovative solutions, you still have humans in the loop. And so, uh, for example, with digital twinning, uh, if you create a high fidelity virtual representation of your systems or network, What's the problem you want to solve? What does normal look like? Not what's the, did we detect an anomaly, but what was that behavior behind the anomaly? Because if we don't know those type of things going in, if we haven't communicated um, to our board across the organization, um, then we lose that culture. That culture breaks down. Oh, it's the security team going off, spending all this valuable capital right now, this, all these valuable, uh, valuable funds on these innovative cybersecurity solutions, then we don't have locks on our doors. So I think it's just important to understand what's the problem we want to solve going in, what creates value in your organization, and flip that around to, if you understand what creates value, you can also understand, you know, enterprise risk and value destruction. And you can understand what are the critical systems or critical data you need to protect. And then once you've answered those questions and you understand this problem you want to solve, 
there are some, again, very exciting applications of machine learning or digital twinning, federated learning for multiple digital twins, better understanding uh, how to upscale and improve computational modeling analytics. And in the blockchain space, again, it's not going away 10 years from now. We probably aren't going to be using paper fiat when we go into the bank, right? So we're seeing even ransomware now changing from, okay, well, we've locked up your data, pay us and you get your data back to the data is the money, <laughs> the data that is the digital assets. And so it's the technologies that are continuing to advance to create new value, new services, new markets that we can't ignore because they're not going away, but also understand the implications. What does that mean to your tech stack? What does that mean to your business strategy? And how do we communicate that in a vernacular across the organization to keep that cyber culture solidified and protected? It's very, very difficult to do. Uh, and we'll love to hear other suggestions from our other talented panelists. Thanks, Ingrid. Thank you. And Matthew, I was hoping you can share with our entrepreneurs worldwide, how can they, what can they do and how can they secure cyber insurance? That's a big problem that I see all the time. They think about 15 million other things, but then when they need to buy cyber insurance, they don't fit any of the criteria. And of course, the wonderful investment then is halted. So can you share a little bit that, everybody can can do some simple things to help themselves to get cyber insurance at, at the level that's required in the US, for instance, as well. Yes, um, cyber insurance is kind of a hot mess right now. Uh, they're, they're, they're having challenges. And let me start off by saying cyber insurance is not a complete risk management plan. It is not a silver bullet. Um, if your idea is, oh, I'm not going to worry about cybersecurity, I'm just going to get a cyber insurance uh, you know, agreement, you're going to lose. Uh, first off, the cyber insurance people won't even want to talk with you because you are too great of a risk, right? And your premiums are going to be way too high. It's, it's, cyber insurance has a role. It can provide a great value for those black swan type of events, but it is not an entire plan onto itself. And the cyber insurance industry is really looking towards their customers putting forth good effort in establishing and maintaining a at least a basic type of cybersecurity and risk management program. Otherwise, you're just uninsurable. So it's important for entrepreneurs to realize that's the situation going in. A you know automobile insurance company is not going to insure you if you don't have a driver's license. If you've never learned how to drive, you're uninsurable. Well, guess what? Cyber insurance is not going to insure you if you don't even have those basics that we've been talking about. So for entrepreneurs, it's really important to start off. Every entrepreneur out there, every small business, medium business, and large corporation, you've got a business plan. Cyber needs to be a part of that plan. And you need to take the same care and diligence as you would in assessing your competitors or your market with cybersecurity. So you need to have goals. You need to understand what level of program that you need. It may be basic, it may be advanced. You may need to be an expert in cybersecurity, depending on what type of target you are and what kind of bad guys are coming after you. <clears throat> but having a plan, having a goal, that gets you that first step. So if, for example, and you could be a small or medium business or whatnot and think, oh, okay, what I need based upon the threats in my business and my peers, maybe I only need basic cybersecurity. Okay, that's where you start with those fundamentals that we've been talking about. But again, you need to have those goals and you're gonna have some, some of the fundamentals address some of the prevention. And there's gonna be a few scattered in there for detection and response or recovery. And if the, the next tier that you think, okay, I really need more of an advanced program, this is where you're talking about bringing more dedicated people, experts into your organization. And that risk assessments that are going to be continual, again, you're going to be more in depth. You're gonna tailor, you're gonna build upon those basics, those fundamentals that we talk about 
that every organization should have to something that's more tailored to your industry, your products, your environment, your specific threats. And that gets you to that next level of being able to manage different risks. And the risks change. The risks that you face today, which you may be thinking, oh, it's ransomware. Those risks tomorrow may be different. So everything has to be very fluid based on the types of attacks and risks. And if you know we take it to the top tier and you've got an organization that is very targeted, maybe targeted by nation states, maybe you're a critical infrastructure or you're in the finance industry or something like that. Right. Or, you know, as you know, with Michael deals with the industrial uh, world out there, maybe you're in transportation or water purification or electrical grid. You're a top tier target. I, I, and there's no surprise there now. Or healthcare. Not. Or healthcare. Or healthcare. Yes. <laughs> we've seen healthcare just brutalized. Um, but really, any of the critical, um, you know, uh, industrial areas, that critical infrastructure. Now you're, you have to be thinking the value proposition here is much, much higher. So as I have that plan and my goals, what are they? Yeah, you may need that expert level where you've got top tier tools and teams. You've got a dedicated GRC team just to keep up with regulations and auditing and everything else. And it gets more complex, but it needs to be complex again to meet those goals. And those goals should not be hidden. They shouldn't be stacked five levels down from the CEO. They need to be up front. They need to be talked about at the board level, at the C-suite level. Everybody needs to be on the same page because it takes everybody. It's not just the CISO's job. It's everybody. And it takes a team effort across the organization. And again, when you talk about your suppliers and your vendors, it's got to be partnership with them too. So every organization, no matter whether you're a brand new startup, right, you, you, you've moved into that midfield or your top tier in your field, it doesn't matter. You need to take deliberate action to have a plan, to work together, set the goals and figure out as part of that value proposition. And it could be just to prevent loss. It could be to enable revenue. And some companies are moving into that space of actually using security as a revenue generator, right? Wherever you are in that, you need to have a plan. And if you Thank don't, you. you're going to be lost. So start with a plan. Thank you. So believe it or not, we're almost at the end of our roundtable, but I would like one more rapid fire uh, from each of your response on what do you think is the forecast for 2024? If you are an entrepreneur worldwide or a business leader or part of a board of directors, what should you be thinking about for 2004 even? What's your prediction? And we'll go in the same order. Chuck, you can go first and then we'll, we'll end with Matt. Sure. Yeah, I, I think we have, we have more of the same coming in 2024, but I think we have some better tools to, as, as a lot of the panelists have mentioned, with machine learning, artificial intelligence to use to help automate some of these issues. I also think there's a bigger trend towards global cooperation. I just came back from a, a conference in Italy and, and they've established a, a national uh, group to, to, do, to look at the cybersecurity issues and also are investing $2 billion in, in trying to help that. So I think it's, a, it's certainly become more of a global interactive issue. And I think there'll be much more collaboration, particularly among the free world because we're facing also not just uh, criminal hackers, but now an increase in state uh, threats, state-sponsored threats. So I, th I think we're going to continue to see that. And those kind of threats are more sophisticated and, and lethal. So I think we have to be very uh, well prepared. And so I see that is a big trend. Thank you. Shara? Piggyback off what Chuck said and the type of attacks, really, the malware, the ransomware, the DDoS attacks, we're going to have greater pr pressure for privacy and regulatory um, things to be put into place. Um, we're gonna see more zero trust being pushed across organizations that will replace different types of VPN type systems and remote working trends are gonna continue the hybrid model. So we will have to take precautions against that with organizations in order to make sure that their employees and their access remain fluid across organizations in a secure manner. And we're gonna have a higher demand for third-party risk management. 
um, when those types of continue. You know, Gardner predicts by 2025, 4% of organizations their software chains will be three times as many in 2021. We see security improvements, you know, in their supply chains, which is why we can expect an increased demand for tools, services, and vendors to really come up to snuff. Thank you. Helen? Well, there will be a prominent gap in risk between increased cybersecurity attacks and underinvestment in cybersecurity due to economic uncertainty and pressure to reduce costs for startups. Um, I would say that uh, the, in, despite of the importance of cyber uh, resilience, uh, companies are still, especially startups, are still under the pressure to reduce cost. And then um, I hope that they would really make getting cyber fit a, liber, uh, a, life, a lifestyle change. And then that has to start, the change needs to start from the board. The next war could be a cyber war across the globe. Absolutely. I posted this morning, uh, some people call it the cyber apocalypse is coming. So that doesn't sound too encouraging. Yeah, if you think about like, Silicon Valley Bank, right, the collapse took 48 hours. If cyber attack happens, that could take even shorter than 40 hours. Yeah, you don't even have 48 hours. Absolutely, absolutely. Michael, you are very much into digital twins, so I suspect your prediction might have something with cyber digital twins. <laughs> yeah, so predictions are, are, are difficult in this space because, as you know, Matt noted that it's it's not static; it's 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 complex, it's linear. This space is constantly evolving. I think what we're going to see in the years to come is like if we look in the last two decades, we've woven together our IT and OT, our cyber and physical systems, to digitize and unlock incredible value across sectors. I think what we're seeing now is, is really the introduction of cyber physical biological convergence. So instead of an array of IoT, an array of vulnerable things that lack basic encryption and authentication, cyber physical biological or biological internet of things on one side, the promise is you know, curing, curing diseases, extending life, bringing sight to the blind. The peril, if we get it wrong, is that biology is random, it's stochastic. We don't fully understand it. And so for the first wave, we're already seeing you know, wireless implantable medical devices, but now as we share our own, our own source code or genomic data, and we apply machine learning to better understand it, we unlock this brave new world, right? Of not only curing diseases and extending life, but this world of cyber physical biological stochasticity randomness that is incredibly exciting <laughs> and uh, full of opportunities we can't ignore it but it's also very dangerous and so we've gone again from you know the 70s and 80s dropouts tinkering on mainframes in silicon valley you know the bill gates of the world to you know folks tinkering around with synthetic biology with crispr kits genetic sequencing in their garage and we don't have the guardrails we don't have the regulation. We don't have the understanding of what that means from a cyber perspective. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. So um, that's my world. And um, this is the team just on this call to help me figure it out because no one has any of the answers. The, reg the, the cavalry's not coming. The regulators have not put up the guardrails to respond. And so we need to get out in front of this. Thank you. Matthew, Friday I'm invited to a quantum computing impact on the economy conference. So maybe you share some of your predictions if, if quantum is coming soon or not and how that can play a role in, in cybersecurity. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, and, and really three areas. First one, emerging tech. You know, there's quantum that's coming out. There's all sorts of fun challenges and, and vetting processes as we're getting closer to the edge there. We've got AI, we've got blockchain, we've got all sorts of different things coming. Uh, the thing that we have to understand is these are very, very powerful tools. And the defenders can use them, but so can the attackers. So it's, you know, the more powerful the tool, the more disruption it is, both for attackers and defenders. So understand as we see all these chat GPT and everything come out and think, wow, that's really cool. It can be really bad, but it can also be really good. It's just a new facet of the war that we face, the continual battle and struggles that we have. 
um, uh, call out to, to what Chuck was saying, uh, nation states. Nation states are pouring billions, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars into offensive capabilities. And the entrepreneurs out there may be thinking, hey, a nation state isn't going to attack me. I don't have to worry about that. You absolutely do. Because when a nation state spends $50 million on an attack and they use it in the wild, everybody grabs it, tears it apart, and now you've got these little cyber criminals that are putting those little pieces, those components into their next version of malware or ransomware that's coming after you. So yes, unfortunately, it was a huge investment in attack tools that is coming, and it's just going to go up. Third thing that we have to, we, we just can't ignore Right now, we see a lot of economic downturn. We're going to see that in the next 12 months at least. That's going to squeeze cybersecurity, right? And so right. cybersecurity professionals, the boards, the executives have to understand that the attackers aren't suffering. They're still going to attack. They may be, be even more motivated to attack. So understand if you start cutting cybersecurity and privacy and regulatory compliance, you're making yourself weaker towards an opposition that's just more motivated. So make de decisions and trade-offs accordingly because normally cybersecurity starts getting cut. It's one of the first ones, unfortunately, moving in economic downturns. So we have to think ahead. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, all your insights and uh, valuable recommendations to our audience. Uh, if you have the chance to stay a few more minutes, it takes only 10 minutes, but I'll share the results of our survey. Again, this was a WBF survey, which covers a lot of countries. We also had more than 10 industries respond to this. So it was nice to see that the concern, like all of you highlighted across numerous industries and they're very much in line with what you have shared. So I'll share the screen really quick. And again, I think you'll enjoy very much seeing that all your comments align with what our uh, leaders said across the world. If someone cannot see the screen, please let me know. I'll just share brief highlights. The, the survey was conducted last year. We focused uh, not only on entrepreneurs, as we mentioned, startup scale ups SMEs, but also asked a few questions about smart cities, because as you know, a lot of uh, startups and scale ups are involved in, in pilots or larger scale projects that are part of smart city deployments. I wanted to also emphasize that this was a collaboration between our WBF Research Institute and our Global Science, Technology, and Innovation Committee. So I would like to once again thank all our members that contributed not only to the survey design, but also to the uh, all the analysis afterwards. So just key findings, I'm not going to read all, but I would like to call your attention that we had 10 industry domains. The highest uh, respondents were in telecommunications, internet and electronics, banking and financials, as you can predict. We had the highest responders from Europe, 51%, followed by North America, 34.69%, and as you can see, Africa and Asia tied for third rank. Most of our respondents were startup owners, 44.90, majority owned multiple companies, and then followed by scale-ups and SMEs, as you can see very close in, in percentage. 43.24% reported not having any type of cybersecurity program in place. Imagine, not one, not, not software, not hardware, no people training, nothing. And then the latest cybersecurity update for those that actually had a cybersecurity program in place was more than 12 to, 14, uh, 12 to 24 months ago. So to all of your points that we have to be dynamic and constantly adapt and constantly be on the lookout, imagine if you do it only once a year or once every two years, you're never going to be in, in good shape to uh, accommodate to all the current threats. I would also like to highlight uh, what, what Chuck mentioned in his keynote, that 43% of attacks were on startups, scale-ups, and SMEs. That's a big misconception I see in the industry. Everybody thinks only the big guys get attacked, only enterprises, and it's not uh, what, what we see in the statistics. So everybody, individuals and the bi small businesses are high at risk. These are just some examples to show you uh, when, when we asked our constituents what barriers they experienced, as you can predict, financial were high, staffing, all of you alluded to, to the, the human capital problem and then technology. Um, and it's not the shortage of technology, but 
the deeper dive in the questions revealed that most of our entrepreneurs worry out of hundreds of products available, which one do you choose? What if you have a very limited budget? What are you going to spend your money on? Because they are flooded with a lot of software that portray the to be the, the shiny toy that will uh, per, protect you from any type of attack, which we know is not true. So then they feel lost because when they buy, let's say, a, a program and they think they don't have to do anything else anymore, and then they get a cyber attack that, that makes them vulnerable, they're, they're all confused and lose trust. So very important element. Then, as you can see, the last time they did the training, as I just mentioned, sometimes 24 months ago, what's the highest area of cyber vulnerability identified? I think it was nice to see the spread, as all of you highlighted. Mobile devices, as we know, uh, particularly during the pandemic, we had much more remote access. So I think that's probably a reflection of that, but also as we know, an increase globally of mobile devices. It's predicted that we have at least 2 billion devices connected to IoT uh, this year. <clears throat> um, what, as you all alluded to, and I think Helen mentioned too, we all get, even as an individual, uh, hacked on a daily sometimes or weekly basis and uh, businesses likewise. So you can see the spread of businesses that had uh, experienced a cyber attack. For those businesses that think that uh, they're safe because they haven't been hacked yet, you're next on the list. So please don't think that if you haven't been hacked yet, it can't happen to you. And then this concerns uh, me, and I think it should concern everyone that, as you mentioned, they don't have the budget to, to dedicate to cybersecurity. So I think that's where we can help um, guide them so that if they spend any money, they spend it wisely, not only on software, but also on the human training uh, that you mentioned. And again, when we looked at the sentiment, thank goodness everybody understands it's very important. That's why we also scheduled this webinar. Uh, and as you can see, when we asked about cybersecurity and cyber resilience, I think the increased efforts we did on training and advocacy maybe are showing some uh, results. Um, also for smart cities, as you can see, the, the respondents are pretty clear that they understand the importance of cyber security and cyber resilience in smart cities. Also, uh, we all emphasize the culture that you mentioned, creating the culture around the technology that we deploy. And as you can see, even here, uh, our entrepreneurs were, were in complete agreement. When we looked at the technologies they're currently deploying, you can see we have quite a nice distribution. Uh, cloud computing, as, as uh, we predicted, is, is the highest one. And then, of course, when we asked about if their city has a robust cyber resilience program in place, we could have predicted the answer. I was surprised to see so much yes, so I would love to get a deeper dive. I think it's probably just the cyber uh, software that is in place, but uh, I would like to, to find out which city, if anybody wants to follow up with us and share if they know a smart city program that has a robust cyber resilience, we would love to take a look at it and evaluate it. And that concludes the, the survey highlights. Just real quick, I wanted to share uh, the fact that we developed as, as part of our efforts in the Global Science Innovation and Technology Committee, a cyber resilience action plan. Uh, all the panelists here are invited to make recommendations how to improve it. We only had five elements we wanted to share so that it's very simple for entrepreneurs to follow. But as you can see, a cyber strategic roadmap, cyber education and training, a cyber quality improvement program. The, all of you emphasize the need to continuously adapt, improve, and be on the uh, lookout for new threats. Alignment with a proactive digital ethics and compliance strategy, uh, because often when we look at data breaches, there is no interoperability between whatever they have for cybersecurity and whatever they have, if they have anything for ethics and compliance. And then last but not least, alignment with Web3. We've not talked about it, but as we know, the industry is transitioning from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0. So having also a, a strategy in place for that transition is, is essential. And last but not least, all of you mentioned, I think, Helen, that was very nice how you also highlighted and all of you mentioned it, that we need a checklist, we need tip sheets, we need very clear guidance and education. So the feedback we received from our entrepreneurs and, and our committee was to create something very simple, not 148 pages of, of guidelines that are very tough to digest, 
So this is one, and again, all of you are experts. If you want to uh, share how we could improve this, we're always eager to hear uh, recommendations. But we identified these top 10, complete an annual cyber risk survey, design and deploy a cyber defense strategic plan. The operating model has to also be changed. You can't think that you're going to have a state-of-the-art cybersecurity program and then operate with old uh, systems in place. Also, the cyber awareness training, cyber defense tools, the vulnerability testing that has to be. Just recently, I was at a very famous conference that I'm not going to mention, and everybody was bragging that they do annual vulnerability testing in healthcare. So I thought I'm going to have a stroke. But in any case, uh, we have to re recommend much more frequent vulnerability testing, of course, particularly in, in highly vulnerable industries. Uh, also, I think there's opportunity to uh, develop cyber safety indicators so that startups can measure and, and compare how they're progressing in their uh, programs. And all the others you already mentioned, all of you, the, the cyber safety culture, the cyber best practices for the team. So once again, this is just a very simple tip sheet that we shared with our entrepreneurs. And again, if you have recommendations how to improve it, we're, we're super uh, willing to, to incorporate those. And that concludes our uh, briefing. I just wanted to highlight a few elements. The full report will be shared with our audience. So they'll have not only the survey results, which is quite extensive, but also our full written up report. Thank you again to all of you for your valuable, not only time, but insights and the expertise that you are willing to share. And uh, we're going to have a, definitely another webinar towards the end of the year. So I'm already extending an invitation for all of you to, to join us. Thank you so much. This concludes our presentation today. Thank you.